couldn't handle Get ready for a battle Cause you know Have you ever, um, you know, you just are, it's maybe you're in a hotel room or maybe growing up if you're younger like, along the lines of like me, um, and you just turned on CBN or something and then there was this church called Lakewood Church and there's this dude named Joel Osteen and um, every time he would kick off a sermon and, you know, we could have discussions on, you know, the theology possibly of Joel Osteen. We could talk about that, but I'm not going to do that this morning because that would take way too long. Um, but he always kicks off his sermons. And he's always like, I'm going to start with something funny, and does anybody know what I'm talking about? No? Okay, well, I'm going to start with something funny, in. and so I have a few jokes to kick us off this morning, because who doesn't like a good joke? Um, so, fun fact, I could be a stand-up comedian. I am the most hilarious person in the world, like, clearly. Um, and so, are you guys ready? Yes? All right, let's go. So, <clears throat> why did the scarecrow... Refused to back down from the crows. Anybody? Because he had strong determination to stand tall and face the flock. St get it? Strong, strong. Yo um, then another one. Why didn't the chicken give up in the staring contest? Think very deeply about this for a second. Because it wasn't going to let anyone ruffle its feathers. <laughs> Hilarious. Um, I have a last one. This one gets me going. <clears throat> Why did Rocky Balboa, any Rocky fans, raise your hand if you like the Rocky movies. Let's go. Only one, to only three Rocky fans. Come on. Um, why did Rocky Balboa never back down from his opponents? Because he knew it was a knock-knock joke, and he was always ready to deliver the punchline. But um, tsh, yeah. Um, speaking of Rocky, um, Personally, like, I, gr growing up and still now, I was just a sucker for the Rocky movies. Um, the entire Rocky series was, like, top tier. I haven't seen the newest Creed movie yet. I've heard from some people that it was good. Other people were like, and the first two were better. Well, I'll give my review whenever I see it. But there, I have a soft spot in my heart for any and all of the Rocky series. It is a classic. If you consider yourself a movie connoisseur of sorts, you are the movie reviewer. If you tell me that you don't like the Rocky movies, I can't trust any of your opinions, because obviously you don't like movies if you don't like Rocky. Um, but with those Rocky movies, in the first movie, one of the main things that gets me was whenever people would try to knock Rocky down, whether it was verbally or physically, he would get back up. Um, you know, the entire premise of the first ever Rocky movie was that Apollo, you know, the champion, you know, Mr. Jab Jab a million times, if you know, um, he was essentially just wanting to box a nobody. Rocky was this nobody. Like, if you ever seen Rocky, you get ready for my Rocky impression. He's like, hey, wait, you know, Apollo, you know. And so, with, with Rocky, um, he was just supposed to be a nobody, you know. He, he, Apollo's just trying to give, you know, this little town and, you know, area of Philly attention. And um, he was, so, so many people were doubting him. They didn't think he would even be able to put up a fight against the Apollo Creed, the champion. I mean, he's just a grimy dude from Philly. And so the entire storyline was that Apollo was boxing a nobody. But if you recall, in the first movie, there is a famous round 14 that I can never, ever forget. And in this round 14, Rocky, in the midst of this fight, within this exhibition battle with Apollo Creed, um, he was so beat up, but he put up a big fight. Like, he was... Like, amazing everybody, because every time he get knocked down, he would get back up. And he was so beat up and tired. At this point in round 14, you know, Apollo, if you know Apollo, he's like, pur, pur, and he's like, you know, doing his whole thing. And then, like, you know, Rocky, he was so tired, he couldn't even put his arms up. He, like, you know, to defend. He's just like, you know, pur, he's getting hit a million times. And then he, he just couldn't defend himself. And then so in the midst of the a million dabs from Apollo with his prancing around, Apollo threw a thick uppercut to Rocky. Like, by thick, I mean with three C's and a Q. It was a thick uppercut. So he hit down Rocky, and then Rocky fell to the ground. And Apollo, at this point, he was straight up convinced that he won. 
like at this point, he had his arms up. He was all like, eh, eh, looking like, and even the commentators were like, oh, Apollo has his arms up in victory. And he was convinced that he won. And, you know, Rocky was down on the ground. And if you recall, Mickey, Rocky is coach, he was literally saying, down, down, stay down, in his like grimy voice. But then you want to know what Rocky did at this moment? Instead of Rocky, you're going to be like, you know what? My face is obliterated. I think I'm just going to take a nap right here and call it a day. That's not what he did. What Rocky did instead was, even with his coach saying, telling him to stay down, Rocky got back up. And at this point, Apollo, like if you recall, he just had a complete face of disbelief. He was like, this idiot, like still going. And Rocky, at that moment, he stood strong. Everybody say strong. In the face of opposition. And so today, this morning, what I'm going to be talking with you all about today is opposition. Everybody say opposition. If you don't know, I am a word junkie, as I like to call it, and so I like to go into the dictionary and find the correct word usage of things, because many times in our society, when we use words, people just kind of use it out of context, or they make their own definitions, as many of us know. Um, But words and how we define them are important. So how you can define the word opposition could simply be resistance or dissent expressed in both action or argument. If you're in this room this morning and you have ever in your life faced a form of resistance because you were doing something, whether it's for God or uh, maybe you're just trying to do something in your life and you faced opposition come towards you, just raise your hand with me because I know in my life I faced opposition for trying to do things. Um, And the thing about opposition and is that it is a natural part of our world. Like, especially if any worthwhile endeavor that you can attempt to take part in, opposition, it's just going to happen. You can't avoid it. There is a reality of opposition in our world. It's just part of the broken human world that we live in. It often intensifies when we're doing something of, of God. When we're doing God's work, opposition, it straight up gets harder. I think of stories, for example, of different pastors, or you might have heard stories of celebrity pastors. Of You hear those stories of pastors falling into a form of sin, and they're doing things that obviously no pastor should be doing, because um, pastors should be at a higher standard, right? Um, but I, I would say that some of those pastors, they, they fell, possibly fell into those temptations because Satan saw the work, the God's work that they were doing, and then he amped up the oppression to them and that he threw in even possibly more temptations to them because they were doing a work of God. Because they were a pastor, Satan just sent extra temptation and opposition their way. And so we see in the Bible, for example, occurrence after occurrence of people doing things for God and opposition just coming, running their way. Occurrence after occurrence. We see it biblically, but then we also see opposition in our natural world Like, take one look on the internet and TV. You see opposition occurring. But we even see um, throughout history and modern human history of people doing things for God and then facing forms of opposition. We saw this with the OG Martin Luther with the Reformation. He obviously faced a lot of opposition, right? We saw Martin Luther King with many of the things that he was doing. He faced a lot of opposition. Opposition in life is inevitable. You can't avoid it. And so today what we're going to be doing As we dive into the book of Nehemiah, I'm just, I I don't want to be a dude who just comes up here and says random opinions. I don't want to be a random podcast dude. I want you, the word, the the word of God to speak for itself, because my opinion does not matter. But what we're going to see in the book of Nehemiah today is some of the opposition and struggles that Nehemiah had when he was rebuilding the Jerusalem wall and how he didn't back down and what we can learn from it and how we can apply it to our own lives today. One of the most beautiful things is that in the Bible, not only is it obviously stuff that happened years ago, but we can so oftentimes find things that we can apply to our own everyday lives. And what we are going to read today um, is no different, and it is really powerful. And so we're going to be taking a deep dive, as I like to call it. At Revolution Youth, um, we're doing a series right now um, in the, uh, we're calling it a deep dive in the book of Matthew. And so I'm really big on just us deep diving deep into the scriptures, like picturing it's a pool, like just picture this as a pool dips it right in. It's great. And then so we're going to take a really deep dive into this. And also, I didn't throw this out earlier. 
but if you know anybody between the grades of 6th and 12th grade, Revolution Youth is awesome. God's doing something really good there. And so doors open at 6.30, service starts at 7. And so even if you know, you know, a 6th or 12th grader, maybe it might not be your kid, invite them over. Be like, hey, there is an epic youth ministry you should be a part of. Um, but we're going to be taking a really deep dive, and we're just going to let this text speak for itself. Does that sound good for you guys this morning? Does that sound good? Yeah, all right, awesome. So, Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And if you have a physical Bible, you can open up, or your Bible app, or you can just look at the floating words on the screen. And if you're online, you can just look at the floating words. It, it starts with this. <clears throat> when Sambala heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who is at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Let's pause right there. I'm just going to say, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Obviously, that's a little bit different of a form of trash talk than what some people use today. But that's kind of an aggressive thing to say. Like, they're, they're just like, that's, that's mean. Like, that's just saying, like, you just like Plato? Like, that's pathetic. But they're straight up, at this point, Nehemiah and those working on the wall, they were getting trash talk up the wazoo, at least in, I guess, in that time's um, version of trash talking. And I can just picture this trash talking happening and, you know, the, you know, the dudes are saying all those things and just the army of Samaria at this point, they're just sitting there chuckling, thinking they're ever so funny and hilarious, trash talking Nehemiah and um, acting as if what they're saying is some sort of fact of life, acting like they're never going to build this wall. How, how pathetic. Those darn Jews thinking they're so darn funny at this point. And it's sad reading that. But in verse 4, what we see where they're going to go over this morning is what does Nehemiah do in response to those insults? Does he just sit there and he's like, you know, human punching bag? He's like, pruh, pruh, you know, kind of like Rocky was to Apollo with the jabs? Or how did, he, how did he respond? Let's see. Verse 4, it says, Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. And then verse 6 it says, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all of their heart. So Nehemiah's response to the insults, it wasn't, to just, you know, be a punching bag and, and, you know, just take it. It wasn't to go debate mode. It was prayer and action. The action, which was they built it up half of its height, as we see in verse 6. So this brings me to my first point today. That there can be an application for us all. In the face of opposition, pray and act. With each of you who walked in here this morning, I don't know what opposition you're facing. It could be a spiritual thing, it could be you're trying to do something for God, or it could just be something going on in your life. But in, in whatever form that opposition is taking, pray and act. Don't just sit there when somebody is, um, you know, bringing forth verbal, say, insulting you. Don't just sit there and argue back and forth, because we didn't see Nehemiah do that. I mean, for one, if somebody is saying they're insulting you, emphasis on the insulting you for something you're doing whether for God or maybe a life choice, like switching a job, if, they're, if somebody's already making the mental decision to sit there and like they're, they're going to insult you, debating isn't going to get you anywhere. If you don't think that if you randomly go Ben Shapiro mode and start showing them the facts and logic behind the error of their ways, that you're magically going to change their mind. I mean, sometimes, I mean, you would hope that would work, but majority of the time, it doesn't. Just take one look at um, social media feeds, such as X, not Twitter, and just see people arguing, and you'll see the majority of the time, let alone, if somebody's saying they're trash talking, they've made up their mind already. And you'll see that debating and whatever 
usually isn't the best course of action when opposition is heading your way. So what we see in Nehemiah Illustrated first is to pray. When somebody is opposing you, don't sit there debating them. Pray for them. Have a conversation with God about it. If truly what you're doing is something that God wants you to be doing, or whatever path or thing that you're doing that they're ever so against is going on, pray and talk to God about it. Talk to God about your frustrations about it, because God cares about those things. We serve a very caring and loving God. Talk to God to give them a change of heart, because so oftentimes, it's not going to be us sitting there and showing them the facts and logic that's going to change their mind. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so if you're doing something for the Lord, pray and say, God, change their heart. Soften their heart. Don't just sit there debating them. And then act. What we see was Nehemiah didn't just pray and then expect God to, you know, for them, they can just, you know, get their popcorn on the side and just watch the, the like Minecraft or something. You just see the blocks going up or whatever. They didn't just sit there doing that. Nehemiah prayed, yes, he spoke to God about it, but then he did something about it. He acted upon it. So for you in your own life, instead of wallowing in the fact uh, that, that you're getting trash talk behind something, as we see with Nehemiah, instead, they continued building the wall. And so for you, whatever your opposition is, prove them wrong. Simply put, there's nothing, like it just, not, not, not in a prideful way of, you know, trying to assert your dominance upon them, but we see it's on Nehemiah, and so we built it to reach half its height. Like he took what their insults were, and he threw it back in their face. I know for me in my own life, um, if you didn't know, I do Christian rap music, and it's very fun, and this is my plug where I just dropped an album. If you want the link or whatever, let me know. Um, but with me and me doing my rap music, I started doing it back when I was like 11, and I was going in my youth group, and I was just like rapping, and I was very cringe, and I, uh, I was, yeah, I was very cringe. It's uncomfortable to think about. I thought I was so good back then, and I, yeah, it was great. Um, but then I had so many people to me going to me, and they were telling me, dude, you're, you're horrible at rapping. Like, you need to stop. I had so many people to tell me, dude, you just need to stop this. You need to put this down. And instead of me letting them take this passion that God, I, I truly believe, put inside of me, um, instead of letting them, you know, put a cap on it and set me up, I just kept doing it, and I proved them wrong. And so whatever, and that is for me in my own life, then I even made a song called Don't Doubt Me. Um, but it can be so easy to let the trash talk from people completely take our mentality and just throw us away. We can take the words that people say to us and we can instill them inside of us. And it can just, it can honestly many times take us to a very mentally dark place. But don't do that. Pray and act, church. Let's continue. And then so in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, it says this. But when Sambala, Tobiah, and the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Astad heard that the repairs to the Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God. See, there's the praying again. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them, and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. So at this point in the text, what we see is that the opposition realized that them just sitting there doing the good old trash talking up the wazoo, it, it failed to lower the morale. If anything, it boosted them up. And then, so since that wasn't working, they decided that since the work was going ahead, the good work, they got angry. And so they plotted against them. And as I said in verse 9, we see that Nehemiah's response was to pray and act his act was by putting a guard day and night there. He didn't hear that the, the opposition was planning stuff against them. And he didn't just pray for God to magically protect them, which he did pray and God can protect. But he also did the good work of putting people there to guard day and night. And 
Nonetheless, in the midst of all this, they were still getting afraid and weary, as we see in verse 12 in, in this verse. So let's see what happens next in response to all of this. In verse 13, it says, Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. Fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Nehemiah, being a good leader at this point, almost went like motivational speaking mode. Um, and not only did he implement things where he stationed people, but he reminded them. He reminded them to not be afraid and to remember the Lord that they serve. This brings me to my second point today. In the face of opposition, remember the Lord you serve. Remember, church, that you, you are serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Moses. The God who parted, caused the Red Sea to part. The God who spoke with his own power every single little thing into existence. And his glorious, amazing power. The God who can make storms stop by not, honestly not even thinking about it. He has the power to do anything just like that. The God of miracles. And so when you're facing opposition, don't just try to go against it within your own power. Because guess what? You're just going to fail. You are going to fail. Remember who you are serving. You're on Team Jesus. If you remember, I did that, that, that sermon not too long ago where I talked about wearing your Jesus jersey. Remember the God that you serve. Think about that. The one who created the universe. That is who you're serving. That is who you have on your side. Isn't that a crazy thing to think about? Think, like, like, sit there and think about this for a second. Take a look outside and everything, just the in, intense design that God's put into our, into our world. The God who designed that created you. And if, if you've given your life to Jesus, you're serving that Lord. And so when opposition comes your way, you don't need to be going through it alone. Actually verbalize to God and talk with God about those things going on. And remember that he's right there with you. So have a conversation with him. And don't go through those things alone, church. We serve a powerful God. Whatever trash talking, whatever, even if things, people try to throw at you um, to try to mess you up, remember the Lord you serve. Let that inspire you this morning. The Lord you serve is a powerful one, church. When you're trying to do something for Jesus, maybe you're trying to spread his name, but people are going against you for it, remember the Lord you serve. When you're overcome completely with anxiety and worry, cast your anxieties upon him and remember who you serve. Let's keep reading. Um, in verses uh, 15 through 18, it says, When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to their own work, or all, our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. I love how it talks about materials in one hand and a weapon in the other. It's kind of an epic thing to think about. Um, what I love about this was Nehemiah didn't just trust in God, but he put in the good work, making sure the people were stationed to defend and he equipped his men at this moment. And they worked together. Nehemiah didn't just take it all upon him to become a superhero with the, you know, his cape going in the wind. Like, whoo, like he didn't do that at all. What he did was he leaned upon people. He would not, Nehemiah would not be able to defend against an entire army of people, right? And so he leaned upon others. 
And so how that can apply to us today, that I would say, is that in the face of opposition, lean upon other people. Lean upon others. If you're going through a form of opposition in your life, please, don't just stare at a wall and just talk to yourself about it. Don't just stare at a wall, getting angrier and angrier. But talk to people about it. Have people in your life, have friends who you can send those text messages to. Say, hey, you know what? This person is going against me. You know, I'm trying to, you know, get this new job. And, um, you know, they, they think I'm really weird for it. And they're making me feel really stupid. Text your friend about it. Talk to people. Have them help you out. We see this illustrated right here because Nehemiah wouldn't have been able to do it on his own, right? I mean, he, he can attempt it. He would fail horribly. But he leaned upon other people. So with whatever struggle, whatever form that you're going on in your life, the opposition, how in your life are you leaning upon others? Or are you having a superhero mentality thinking that you can do it all on your own? Quite oftentimes, we can, you know, just pray to God about it. And God most definitely has the power to help you in the midst of those moments because we're talking about the creator of the universe. Um, and so he can, he can definitely help you. But he also doesn't want us to just be secluded to ourselves. God, we see it illustrated all throughout the Bible because I feel like there's been so many times I've came up here than when, you know, the, the topic I'm given and the scriptures, it always at some point talks about essentially leaning upon other people, having mentors, etc., and I, that's a consistent thing that we honestly see throughout Scripture is that God places those around us for a reason. And so don't neglect who God has placed around you in your own life. Don't go through whatever you're going through, the opposition. Do not go through it alone. Lean upon the strength of others because your strength is going to diminish and you need other people to help you out. Amen? Let's go into chapter 5. As I said, we're going to keep going through this and let, just let the text speak for itself. And so, I told you we're taking a deep dive. Raise your hand if you're ready for chapter 5. Only a few people. All right, <laughs> All right let's go. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says, Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Good old grain, Quaker. Um, others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our homes to get grain during the famine. <clears throat> Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. So at this point, clearly, what we see going on is that there is an economic and food-related conflict that's occurring from within. And what I think is really cool that we're about to dive in is that we get to see what Nehemiah's response to this is. Instead of just saying, no, get your own food, you know, just be gritty, come on, suck it up, buttercup. We, we don't see that. Let's see what it is. In verse uh, 6 through 13. <clears throat> when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people, only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves and houses, and also the interest you are charging them. 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will, do not, we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. 
And I love that right there because it, you, even, I, I feel like, oh my goodness, like we see our own politics that we see uh, over all over the media now. And we just see some of the grimy stuff and how people operate, right? Um, this is a more of a political setting back then, right? And it just kind of shows that humans are the same throughout history. So Nehemiah was like, I know you guys are darn pol political people. So I'm going to make you take an oath to make sure you actually follow through with what you're saying. That this isn't just some sort of like speech or something that you're doing to get votes. Um, and then, maybe not votes, but you, you know what I mean. Um, that in this way, um, wait, 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 verse 13. I also took out the folds of my robe and said, in this way. May God take out of their house and possessions anyone who does not keep this promise. So may such a person be taken out and emptied. At this, the whole assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Really quick, I feel like our government can learn something from this. Amen. Ne um, that was really good. Um, but jokes aside, with the power that Nehemiah had, he made it his mission to deal with the internal conflict going on within, with the economic disparities and the oppression that was occurring. And really quick, I do want to say that Nehemiah, he sowed such an amazing form of leadership and humility through this. And I think that we all can find our own personal things that we can draw from, just his great leadership that we, that we see um, all throughout the book of Nehemiah. So not only were they facing opposition, in, at this time, from the outside, they were facing opposition from the inside. And Nehemiah didn't ignore it. He stepped up and he addressed the conflicts. He did something about it. And church, we can draw from this my fourth and final point for us today. In the face of opposition from within, address the conflicts. Not every time opposition is going to be coming from the outside it can most definitely be from within. When you're doing something, especially for the Lord, there are quite possibly things right now that are within your own field house that need to be addressed. If left unresolved, the work you are doing can come to a just complete grinding halt. So what could this be for you in your life? The, the conflicts within, what could it be? It could be unrepentant sin, you're trying to do something for God, but then you have sin that you refuse to give to him that you don't have any form of feeling bad about. It could be that. It could be mental health struggles that you don't want to go and possibly see a psychologist or a therapist to work through some of those things. But God has given us people such as therapists to work through those things in a healthy way, and that is a blessing. Um, maybe you're afraid to or whatever. We all have our own personal reasons that can be the reason that we don't do things like that. But maybe it's mental health struggles that you're ignoring. And I think we all know that mental health has completely gone down the tubes. And we, we need to address those things. We can't just ignore it because mental health is a problem. And I've said that multiple times up here. Or there are just things in your life that you're just ignoring. Whatever that is, you can insert the blank for what that could possibly be within your own life. But church, what internal things are you ignoring? Are you trying to do something, but then you're just ignoring whatever it is? It could be multitudes of different things, as I said. But address the conflicts. Don't let it stop you from whatever you're trying to do. It might not be stopping you now, whatever it is. But it could quite possibly hit a point to where it does come, it's come to a grinding halt. And I always, I, I revolution youth, I always talk about, I call it the great scale of truth. And so Pixar, there's a scale right here. Would it be, so let's, you know, you know, the weight scale, you know. Um, so picture that in your head. Are you picturing it with me? Sweet. So let's, we're, we're placing weights on each of the sides. And then so it, 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 if you're supposed to, it, one side is to decide, all right, do I deal with this conflict now or later? Majority of the time what's going to occur is that it's not going to be like later. Woohoo. Majority of the time I would say, that it's better just to address the conflicts now instead of letting it cook like a crock pot and get worse and worse over time. So whatever that looks like in your own life, an unrepentant sin, mental health, don't let time make it worse than what it already is. Address the conflict from within. Also, 
On top of this, there is one other thing that I think is the, not I think I know, is the biggest internal conflict that all of us at some point of our life have had and had to address. And this conflict is the conflict of our own soul and our own spirituality. We can't just live our life thinking that we're all good. We, I mean, we can, we can hear opinions from people. Yeah, I mean, sir. But that lacks a firm foundation. And so for each and every single one of you in here, I just want to ask you, have you addressed the internal spiritual conflict from within you? Do you even have a relationship with Jesus Christ? The Bible says that the, the only way that we can reach heaven is to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. To believe that he rose from the grave in three days and died on the cross for our sins. We have a, the, this idea that kind of penetrates our society is that you can just be a quote-unquote good person and you can make it to heaven. But the question always becomes, okay, how are you defining good? As I said earlier, the words and how we define them matter, right? Where are you getting this idea from good, uh, of good, from? Is it from your own opinion? Because then, the, I mean, the good within society, it just changes throughout time. We see that all throughout regular human history, things that were defined as bad are now defined as good and vice versa. We, we see that. You, you can't make it to heaven, biblically speaking, by being ever so holy, being ever so good. Because the only way that we can reach holiness is not by our own good works at all. It's through the price that Jesus paid on the cross for you and I. And I believe that this might be a moment for some of you in here to address this internal conflict of whether or not you follow Jesus Christ. You've possibly had moments to where you could have given your life to him before, but there was something that was stopping you. But I want you to know that the time of salvation is now. I, I used to have in my own life, I, I, there was a period in my life where I was an atheist and I, I didn't want to believe in Christ. There's sins in my own life that I wanted to do and I just didn't, it, it, it didn't sound right. And then so I kind of went a case for Christ mode type thing, if you ever read that book, fire book, top tier. And I threw everything on the table and I threw all the science, all the religion, everything right there because I, I did not want to believe in Christ. There are things I wanted to do, but I'm also a person to where truth, it matters. And I always say that if I, um, if I looked into the science and the history of religion and everything, I would be a Muslim right now if all the truth lined up to Islam. But guess what? It all lined up to Christianity. And there is more proof than we give God credit for. He's given us a lot of indicators of his existence. And historically, of Jesus really dying on the cross and rising. So I believe that God's speaking to some of you this morning to just trust in him. Trust in the work that he did on the cross and to stop putting it off. Address that internal conflict. That, that is something that you're going through this morning. And accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There's no reason to be putting it off. Picture the great scale again. But that said, I have some takeaway questions for us. If you're taking notes or photos or whatever, you can um, do that. Um, and it's just simply questions for you. Where in your own life can you pray and act more? Are you finding yourself sitting idly by when opposition or anything's going on? When can you pray and act? What does that look like for you? Where in your life do you need to remember the Lord? We can get so crazy in our busyness of life, we can allow the anxieties and the stresses hit us like a you know, million mile per hour semi, and then we can forget to slow down and remember the power of the amazing God that we serve. And how can you better lean upon others around you? Have you been, just kind of been a loner a bit, and you haven't been talking with people about the things that you're going through, the opposition that you might be facing? We saw illustrated in, the, in Nehemiah 
that he couldn't to tackle the opposition without the help of others. And I didn't write this down for the other take home, but it's also what internal conflicts within your own life do you need to address? What have you been ignoring? What have you been ignoring? We're going to enter into a time of prayer in a second. And I'm just going to ask you some questions. And if any of these questions sound like you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And there's nothing magical or whatever about raising your hand. Like you don't start levitating if you raise your hand. But it is a really powerful form of self-reflection and commitment. So can I just have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes at this time? I'm going to ask you some of these questions. If you're in this room and you've been facing forms of opposition and you need to grow in praying, acting, remembering the Lord, leaning upon others, addressing conflicts from within possibly, and you want to ask God for help with those things, because let me tell you, it is hard. Our world is really hard to live in. And you want to ask God for help? I'm going to ask you to raise your hand with nobody looking around. In three, two, one. Hands all over. And then lastly, if you're in this room and you haven't committed your life to Jesus Christ, let me tell you that he died on the cross for you. For your sins, he got nail-pierced hands, went through a gruesome death for you, and rose in three days. If you want to declare for the first time that you believe in him and place your life in his hands, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in three, two, one. So, Lord God, we, we praise you. We praise you to the highest of highs. And, God, for those who ro- rose their hand to accept you, God, I, I, I just right now, if you rose your hand, I, I just encourage you right now to take this time to either out loud or internally declare to him that you believe in him, that you accept what he did on the cross, and that you, you commit to following him. And however you know how and to grow in that relationship. And accept the forgiveness that he offers you because he can forgive you for everything that you've done, that you've ever done. Not because you deserve it, but only because of how good he is. Take the time right now just to communicate that with God. And then, Lord God, for everybody in this room, all the hands who I just had a weird yawn, all the hands in this room, God that rose about needing help for whatever form of opposition that they're going through, God, I ask for your supernatural help. God, instill in us a desire to pray and act so much more that we aren't going to be people who just sit idly by, but not that we become Ben Shapiro sitting there debating God, but that we're people who pray, act, remember you, lean upon others, and address any of the conflicts from within. God, I pray for so many of the conflicts in this room that might be represented. God, I pray that you help us to know what to do to address those things, that we don't just ignore it. God, help us not be an idly sitting by church, God. Help us to be active within all the forms of opposition that we can face. And God, we ask you for your strength because we cannot do this alone. We can try so hard, but God, it is nothing in comparison to the power that you can provide. So God, help us to put our own human pride aside and to let you step in. God, help us to do that. We ask for your will to be done and for your continual leading in whatever situations that are represented in this room, God. And God, we thank you just for your love and the multitudes of ways that you care for us and that you stretch us. And God, help us to address everything going on in our lives as it relates to opposition. We praise you, God, and we glorify you. In your amazing name, amen. As a church, it is our honor to be a small part in all that God is doing in and through your life. And we would love to continue with you on that journey. To find out more about what your next steps can be at Kenosha City Church, 
All you have to do is go to kenosha.church slash next steps. Thanks again for joining us today.